everyone. Uh, interesting times giving presentations online these days. So um, as uh, Emerson mentioned, I'm Stephanie Call. I am an application specialist with Nanotemper. Um, and most of my background is actually in structural biology and uh, biophysics. So when I was designing this uh, webinar about gene therapy, I really wanted to approach it from my area of expertise um, and looking at molecular stability, molecular interaction. So a lot of the aspects we're going to be approaching this today come from the realm of biophysics rather than maybe genetic design or um, optimal um, genetic delivery. So with that, I'm going to turn it all the way over to my presentation. Um, so yeah, so today we're talking about the importance of molecular interactions and stability in gene therapy. Most of the approaches we're going to discuss today are going to be from a basic research aspect. Um, we'll talk a little bit uh, just in passing about manufacturing and scale up, um, but most of what we're going to discuss is more for basic researchers in the lab. The topics we're going to cover is I'm going to give a very abbreviated history of gene therapy and talk a little bit about what the current challenges are. Then I'm going to move into a few case studies um, and we'll discuss how each one of those are relevant to gene therapy, biophysics, and how they will help propel the field forward. Um, and then finally, um, I wanna take a little bit of time to talk about how my company, Nanotemper, is helping to contribute to this field. Um, and then we'll have a wrap up summary. So to begin, what is gene therapy and what are the challenges researchers face? Um, again, here's our very abbreviated timeline of gene therapy. Um, and almost since the discovery of the gene, the idea of being able to edit and fix genes for monogenic disorders has been in the minds of scientists. But it was as early as 1973 that Theodore Friedman uh, predicted a lot of the challenges that we were going to see with gene therapy. And we'll talk about those in a minute. Um, but as you can see, there's a big jump in that timeline. And it wasn't really until the early 90s that gene therapy first uh, was actually developed as used for patient care. And for those who uh, might not have been around in the early 90s or who haven't uh, become familiar with this history, there were a lot of well-publicized failures in gene therapy, a lot of really tragic cases involving loss of life um, and just failure to do any of the publicized work. So in 1996, the NIH did a deep dive investigation and ultimately concluded that we just did not have a good understanding of the vectors and the targets necessary for gene therapy. Um, fast forward a couple of years and we did start to see some commercial gene therapies approved, um, but it wasn't until really the late 20 teens that we saw gene therapies get FDA approval in the US. But in about the past year and a half, there has been a combined $2 billion investiture in developing the gene therapy field. So this is a really er big area of interest. A lot of people want to develop gene therapy as a technique and be able to apply it to more diseases, more disorders. Um, but it is only very recently that we've really um, been able to actually apply gene therapy in a safe and uh, efficacious way. Um, to look a little bit more closely here, this is a, a great sort of timeline that comes from this science review. It's called Gene Therapy Comes of Age seems to get updated every couple of years and most recent was 2018. So there's a lot of really good information in here if you are interested in more about the history of gene therapy. Um, but looking at the clinical studies, um, I wanna point out um, this little timeline about the efficacy and safety. So you can see here, it wasn't until uh, the late 90s that we saw gene therapy even start to work in patients, but there was a lot of genotoxicity associated with it. And it's only in about the last decade that we've seen efficacy and safety in conjunction with gene therapy. So again, though this field has been studied for a very long time, it is only very recently that we've really had successful gene therapeutic uh, methods applied to patients in a hospital setting. One other little thing I'd like to point out is we have this age of editing. So um, with the development of CRISPR-Cas9, that has helped a lot with the um, development of um, better uh, actual genes and gene editing. 
Um, so now the question is about delivering those genes. I also want to give a quick screenshot also from that review um, covering the patient la patent landscape. Um, this is for T cells specifically, and we are going to talk about how gene therapy relates to these T cell treatments in, in one of our case studies. Um, but the real take home I want you to get from this is just that if you look at the dates of the breakthrough designation and product approval, these treatments were only approved uh, in the last six years or so. So again, very a relatively new field considering how long we've been working on gene therapy. So what are the challenges? What do researchers face when they're designing gene therapy uh, methods? Um, the main ideas here are improved potency, more stringent tropism, and reduced immune response. So improved potency, we want to deliver those genes to the patients, have them work efficiently, reprogramming whatever they need to reprogram. Um, we want them to get to the cells of interest. Um, so that's where tropism is going to come in. How do we make sure that our gene therapies get delivered to the appropriate cells? Not every cell in the body might need this gene therapy. And especially with um, some of the specific applications we'll discuss, um, it's really important that there's no off-target effects because that's what leads to some of that genotoxicity we saw. Finally, reduced immune response. So Whenever you introduce a foreign object basically into your body, your body is going to fight it off with an immune response. And we don't want that to happen with our gene therapy delivery uh, because if it does, it will be less potent and it might uh, influence the tropism as well. So ensuring that the body doesn't try to attack these deliverable genes is really important for successful patient treatment. So the specific points in bold that I've highlighted here are going to be particularly relevant to our discussion today, um, but I think it's really important to think about all of these things when you are um, considering gene therapy. Our first case study is going to be in humanizing CAR T therapies. Um, for those of you who might have been on um, one of these webinars a few weeks ago, I believe that there was a investigation of CAR-T therapies. So hopefully for some of you, this isn't new territory, but for those who might not know much about um, CAR-T treatment, I'm going to explain a little bit about the therapy and where the cells come from. And then we'll talk about this paper that um, is our case study for this example. So CAR-T therapy, uh, the T comes from T cells. They're taken from a patient's blood, and then they are engineered uh, with a chimeric antigen receptor, the CAR, um, and it will target certain receptors on the cancer cells. These uh, engineered T cells with the chimeric antigen receptor are expanded and returned to the patient by infusion, where they hopefully target the cancer, only the cancer, and therefore eliminate the cancer from the patient um, but leave the healthy cells alone. Uh, it's been used to treat several different kinds of cancers, um, specifically a lot of the leukemias, um, a few carcinomas, and there's a ton of trials in the market to get other cancers. That kind of goes back to the slide I showed you before. Um, to give this nice little um, picture of what's happening, um, you can see here we remove the patients from, or the T cells from the patients. Um, we reprogram them with the chimeric antigen receptor. We expand the reprogrammed cells, reprepare them and infuse them as part of the chemotherapy treatment. Um, and in theory, they expand, they detect the cancer cells and they only eliminate cancer cells. So how is this related to gene therapy? If we look at the reprogramming step here, we have this viral vector delivering the chimeric antigen receptor to the T cells. Um, so obviously engineering that viral vector is very important. We want to make sure it uh, effectively delivers uh, the chimeric antigen receptor gene to the T cells so that they can incorporate it and start expressing those chimeric antigen receptors. Um, but not only that, another thing to consider is once the vector has uh, delivered its genetic payload, we need to expand the cells that have um, that have only the chimeric antigen receptor in them. Um, so this is what we'll kind of be focusing on is the reprogramming, and we'll talk about the multiplication a bit. Um, and that's really what this group was looking at when it came to um, their paper. 
And so again, just thinking about safety and efficacy in the context of CAR T treatment, um, we need to engineer the uh, chimeric antigen receptors um, and integrate them into the T cells. Um, so this becomes kind of a manufacturing question. And again, we're not going to talk too much about scale up, um, but we do need to think about once we get these genes into their targets, how do we make sure that they expand and proliferate? Um, ideally, we want to engineer the um, chimeric antigen receptor to have fewer off-target effects. Obviously, that's very important for patient safety. Um, and they have to persist in the system after infusion. So it's great if you can create these uh, hybridized T cells that have this new antigen receptor on it. But if your body finds them a foreign invader and removes them from circulation, they can't do any good for the treatment. Um, oh, and one other point I wanted to make um, for the safety is we need to make sure we expand the correct cell lines, which I mentioned. And there's actually a fairly recent and very sad case where a cancer cell infiltrated that expansion pool, resulting in patient death due to the cancer um, reintegrating into the patient. So um, here's the link to that article. It's um, an interesting consideration when we're talking about the safety uh, for patients when we're expanding these um, CAR T cells. So specifically what the group wanted to do, um, first of all, previous therapies, um, the, the chimeric antigen receptor was designed to target CD19. It uses a single chain variable fragment to do that. But that single chain variable fragment is derived from murine antibody sequences. So uh, mouse antibody sequences are gonna cause an immune response in a human host. Um, and then the second problem they were addressing was inconsistent and sometimes insufficient expansion of the CAR T transduced cells. So once they've delivered the uh, vector, once the payload has been released, how do they make sure that the population that expands actually has these chimeric antigen receptors on them? So they did two things to overcome this problem. Um, and this is where I think there's a really interesting approach to the biophysics of designing these uh, antigen receptors of interest. Um, so as I mentioned, they used a single chain variable fragment to build these chimeric antigen receptors. So you can see here from an antibody, we have the FAB region. Um, and the single chain variable fragment is the heavy and light chain of the variable region, and it's connected by a linker. So what they did was, is they took that linker and engineered it to be a selective domain that they called the E tag. They used a small antibody that could target the selective linker tag um, in order to help with the expansion. So uh, if they can pull out this uh, antigen receptor because it has the selective domain on it using this small antibody, they can increase the population of cells that are positive for their new chimeric antigen receptor. Um, additionally, what they did is I mentioned that these variable fragments from before were derived from mouse sequences, and now they derived them from the human sequence. And what they wanted to do was measure how the affinity for this single chain variable fragment receptor that they made um, has increased affinity for the human CD19. So this is where uh, my company comes into play. Um, Nanotemper has an instrument for measuring the uh, affinity of biological molecules in solution. Um, it's called microscope thermophoresis, or MST. Um, and for those who may not be familiar with it, it broadly works by measuring how a fluorescence molecules, how a fluorescent molecules fluorescence changes in response to a small temperature increase. And the degree of a fluorescence change is dependent on the bound state of the molecule. Um, so they have it here plotted as fraction bound, but there is a different response depending on whether the um, receptor is bound or unbound to the CD19. Um, and so you can uh, nicely have a nice visual representation of where the KD is using the fraction bound method. And what we see here is there's almost six time increase in affinity for the human CD19 when we use the humanized chimeric antigen receptor rather than the murine one. So already we have increased the affinity, which uh, should lead to increased potency just by changing that variable fragment to a humanized sequence rather than a murine one. So part two is getting more of the humanized chimeric antigen receptor. 
Um, and that's where that ETAG comes in. So they expanded all of the different receptors using either with or without the small antibody. And you can see here, there's almost a 50% increase in the pool uh, that contains the um, chimeric antigen receptor when we use that expansion on the selective domain. Um, and here's some um, flow cytometry data to back that up. Um, you can see here when we expand the pool with the small molecule, small antibody against the linker, we have a much larger pool available um, for the um, CAR T treatment. So, um, in one fell swoop, we've hopefully increased the potency, and we've also hopefully increased the um, targeting and efficiency because we have more of our um, CAR T cells. So they put it into mice. Um, the details of the experiment are here, um, but the summary version is, is that um, we had increased survival when we used the humanized uh, chimeric antigen receptor expanded with our small antibody compared to the murine one or the non-expanded one. Um, so just giving the patients, in this case mice, more of the, um, more of the CAR T cells that better target the CD19 on the cancer cells uh, increases median survival. The last thing to do is to test whether uh, humanizing our chimeric antigen receptor really does decrease the immune response and uh, increase persistence in the patient. So um, this group had five patients. Um, they were all relapsed, um, all treatment, um, and they had previously received an infusion of murine CAR T cells and had no response or the response had quickly died off from the murine infusion. Um, I have examples here from just patient one. Um, most of the patients had positive responses, although they had very different uh, presentation of the disease. Um, but in this example, we can see here, this first infusion in green is the murine CAR T cells versus the second infusion in red is the humanized ones. And you can see in both cases, um, there's kind of low expression for about 10 days out. Um, but the humanized one kind of expands rapidly and persists in the system a month out after treatment versus the murine ones that seem to have basically died off by day 15. Um, and the antibody tests of the sera also validate that um, we have persistence both before and after of IGs that target the murine chimeric antigen receptor, but there's no to negative expression of these IGs that target the humanized one. So we've decreased the immune response and therefore helped boost the persistence of these CAR T cells in the patient. So that's all I have on the CAR T cells. I think it's a really interesting uh, intersection of how biophysics and rational design uh, can really apply well to gene therapy methods and uh, drug delivery methods within patients. So my second case study is going to talk about optimizing the delivery of pegylated molecules. Um, it's actually going to be a two-parter. First, I wanna talk about um, actually delivering pegylated molecules, um, but the example here will be with um, small molecule medicines. And then we're gonna talk about this paper so that we can connect the dots between pegylation of medicines and pegylation of nucleic acids, therefore, uh, being applied to gene therapy and gene delivery in the patient. So we'll talk briefly on pegylation, and then we will get into these two reviews. So polyethylene glycol is a polymer that can be functionalized and added to a molecule of interest. You can see it here. Um, and here's a nice little schematic of how pegylation would work on a protein. You can see it increases the uh, size of the protein, so it reduces kidney filtration. It increases the solubility because of the hydrophobicity of the peg, so that helps it persist in the system better and uh, have less issues with aggregation or falling out of solution. Um, and the peg also helps block proteolytic enzymes and antibodies from identifying um, in this case, the protein, but really whatever your pegylated target of interest is. So I want to talk about how we can apply this 
to gene therapy. So again, first we're gonna talk about it in the context of nanomedicines, and then expand that into nucleic acids and gene therapy. Um, so the first one, we we're talking about better targeting those pegylated molecules. Um, in this example, the group was looking at um, triple negative breast cancer, which expresses endothelial growth factor receptor, good old EGFR. Um, and that was used as the targeting factor to deliver the medicine to the cancer cells. Um, the targeting hurdles they needed to overcome, they need to find the cell, but they also need to be ensure, to ensure that whenever they find that cell, the payload gets internalized and released inside of the cell. It's great if you can find those receptors and you've designed a really good targeting system, but it doesn't do you a lot of good if whatever your medicine is just hangs out on the surface of the cell. You need to internalize it so that it can target whatever it needs to inside of the cell. So they did a really clever thing. They created a uh, peg engager system. Um, so this is a bispecific humanized anti-peg fab, which is what targets the peg. Um, crossed with an anti-tumor antigen single-chain disulfide stabilized variable fragment, which targets EGFR, or they use CD19 for the negative control. So the engager has two halves. This lower half binds the receptor. The upper half is going to bind the peg. Um, and what it does is, is first it finds the receptors. They hang out on surface, and they do not get internalized until the pegylated nanocargos um, can enter the system. Um, so this increases the um, likelihood that our pegylated nanocargos are going to um, target the appropriate um, receptors. And you need that mediator because PEG, as we saw, is just a long uh, poly polymer, polymer chain. Um, so it doesn't really have any specificity on its own. So this is a mediation system that really allows it to target um, the receptors of interest better. Um, so first, they wanted to characterize the PEG engager system. So um, like I said, they created both a EGFR and a CD19 targeting one, and then both of them bind to PEG. Um, so once again, they turned to MST to calculate the uh, strength of interactions. Uh, this was likely important because PEG can be really viscous, and working in solution um, is really helpful for um, being able to uh, measure that interaction. So here we have the EGFR engager and the CD19 engager, both bound to PEG. In both cases, they have really similar affinities in the low nanomolar range. Um, and then the second deal is to measure um, the affinity for the receptor for the affinity of the engager for its receptor of interest. Um, and so you can see here again, um, the EGFR one perhaps has slightly higher affinity, but they're both really in the same low nanomolar range. So they're very tight binders. Um, they uh, work nicely in solution and they bind both the receptor of interest and the peg. Um, so I really loved this paper because they had some great confocal work in here. And I think it really just spoke for itself, um, kind of a picture is worth a thousand words. So start here, here's two EGFR positive breast cancer cell lines. In red, you can see just the PEG engager, um, and it has been triggered after one minute, so it starts to internalize. Um, and after 60 minutes, you can see in both cell lines, there's a lot of internalization of that PEG engager that targets EGFR. The CD19 negative control shows uh, no engagement and no internalization. And in MCS7s, which are EGFR negative, uh, we see no interaction at all. So um, I think these pictures really clearly show how this engager binds the cells. Um, and to further expand on that, we also have to make sure that they're delivering the medicine of interest. So here we have some cells. This is before we add the um, Q dots, which are mimicking our pegylated nanomedicine. So they're pegylated Q dots. Um, and in theory, these peg engagers should not internalize until we treat them with the pegylated Q dots because that's what triggers the internalization. At the same time, they wanted to measure uh, lysosome activity and co-localization with the lysozymes uh, because uh, we need to make sure that when um, the medicine is delivered, it gets processed and released into the cell. 
Um, so here in green, that is the EGFR peg engager. Blue is hocus staining, and red will be our Q.655. And the pseudo color purple is Lyso Tracker Red DD99. So um, that's what um, targets the lysozyme. You can see after just five minutes, we have a ton of internalization of the Q dots, and they're co localized with the um, Lyso Tracker. And by 60 minutes, a lot of the Q dot is no longer co localized because it's been released into the system um, and is now circulating in the cells. So we have our lysozyme down here and our uh, cell or lysosomes down here and our Q dots um, exposed to the cell. Um, and this is just some quantification. The red bars indicate that there's not really any internalization until we trigger it with the uh, Q dot. Once it's triggered, uh, we see after 60 minutes, a lot of peg engager internalization, about 75%. And co-localization with the um, lysosomes are, is also quite high. Um, so now we know it works great in cells on a confocal microscope, but does it scale? Uh, so here they wanted to look at mice treated with the PEG engager system versus given free medicine. Um, and you can see here the PBS control and um, the PEG engager without any medicine on it lead to very large tumor growths in mice. Um, however, um, and then this is a comparison with just um, free doxorubicin, so the treatment method. Um, but when we start adding the um, PEG engager methods, we see a dramatic drop off in the tumor size growth. And that's true for two different um, EGFR positive triple negative breast cancer cell lines. Um, so again, the take home message here is that we need to really thoughtfully design how to deliver pegylated medicines because PEG is a great approach to keep our uh, payloads circulating in the system, but we really need to think about how will they actually get to where they need to go. It's great if they can circulate for longer, but if they can't target uh, whatever we need them to find, it's not very helpful for us. So how do we apply this to uh, gene therapy? And there are people doing some pretty cool structural work looking at um, how oligonucleotides form complex micelles when you uh, make, when you use PEG as a carrier for them. Um, so this group just did a really nice structural characterization of how different oligonucleotide formations are going to affect um, the size and shape of the pegylation. Um, so um, one of the key take homes here wasn't so much the structural work, which I'm not gonna talk too much about, um, but they needed to make these, um, these micelle preps that were made of peg-carried peg oligonucleotides. And the protocols that exist for them vary widely and they needed low polydispersity. You can't get a good structural readout if your prep isn't super consistent. Um, and so, Really one of the big take homes from the paper is that they tried many different protocols and found that the two most reliable ones were here. Um, thermal annealing uh, in PBS for two hours at 75 or isothermal salt annealing where we slowly dialyze sodium chloride out from one molar concentration. Um, this is what gave them the lowest polydispersity and made the most reliable um, pegylated carry, uh, nucleic acid carriers. Um, and I think that ends up being a really important point to make when we do start to consider um, engineering and scale up and manufacturing. How do we get these protocols that are going to give us consistent and reliable uh, delivery methods? Um, and so they use SAC smalls and cryo EM in order to visualize the data. Uh, here's the cryo EM data. Uh, don't worry too much on what the shapes mean specifically. We're going to talk about that, but you can just see. Uh, when we use single-stranded DNA versus double-stranded DNA, the pegylation dramatically changes its orientation. And combined with their MALS and SACS data, what they determined is that when we use this lysinated peg, so we use the positively charged lysine on the end of the peg in order to bind the negatively charged DNA, um, if it's single-stranded, we form spherical micelles, and when it's double-stranded, we form cylindrical micelles. Um, 
Again, that might not seem too groundbreaking, but it's really important to know what these packages look like in order to better develop their delivery methods. So even though this doesn't talk too much about actually delivering any of these nucleic acids, I think it's a really important step in pegylated gene therapy delivery methods to understand how preparation plays into the um, shape of whatever we're delivering, which is going to be important if we are talking about something like a PEG engager that needs to bind the PEG. We need to make sure that PEG is available for binding. Um, and finally, I wanna talk about this case study about developing a new method of gene delivery. Um, so this was a pretty cool paper because this group is basically trying to do something kind of brand new. Um, and it's they use chromatin wrapping as their mediator for carrying their genetic payload. Um, so what problems are they addressing? Right now, when we think of gene therapy, 99% of the time, you probably think of delivery using AAV, so adeno-associated viruses, lentiviruses, anything in the lab where you basically have a small virus acting as your carrier, and that's how you deliver it to the cells. Um, however, that is associated with toxicity. Um, thinking about scale-up for patients, there have been um, issues with efficacy and safety. A lot of those have kind of been ironed out, but there's still always the concern. I think right now we all kind of are worried about viruses. So um, how do we create a new gene delivery method um, using biochemical engineering? Um, so I'm going to uh, explain how they built this carrier. Um, some background you'll need to know for that is first they needed the CPXM2 peptide. It's derived from a human carboxypeptidase-like protein X2. Um, and that binds nucleic acid via the negatively charged backbone. Um, we'll see a schematic in a minute, so don't worry too much. I just wanted to give everybody some background. Um, and they used the biotinylated version of that peptide so that they could bind it to an antibody carrier. And then they needed, in turn, to optimize the antibody carrier. Um, so they tried a couple different um, biotin binders, including a monovalent and a bivalent one. Um, and they found an increased affinity for the bivalent one, which is likely not surprising due to avidity effects, basically two peptides combined per antibody. Um, and importantly, they detected there was no aggregation when they did this binding. Um, so that indicates no severe cross-linking. And once again, they did those KB measurements using a, um, MST, a monolith from Nanotemper. Um, which also helped them determine that there was no aggregation when they did this measurement. So um, it gave them really two pieces of information, not just the KD, but also the um, aggregation. So to give you guys a picture of what the genetic vehicle looked like, um, here in purple is our biotinylated CPXM2 peptide. You can see it's binding um, the DNA. The single strands are in... Uh, black, and then they're wrapped around histones. And they used histones as a carrier medium uh, because DNA is pretty good at wrapping and unwrapping around histones. Uh, so once it was in the cell, uh, they thought that histones would make a good release method for their double-stranded DNA. Um, so that covers the DNA binding. So now um, on our little biotinylated CPXM2 peptide, um, we then added this antibody that they developed. Again, they used the uh, bivalent one. So this green part represents the antibiotin uh, small chain variable fragment. And you can see it binding these um, biotinylated peptides. And then the FAB region contains the cell surface antigen selective region. So that's what's going to target only our cells of interest. Um, and they just used GFP as a readout for efficiency. Um, and I think these graphs are really uh, telling when they used their method here. Um, we have a really high population of GFP positive cells. It's almost 90% um, compared to lentiviral lipofection, which is still only about 50 to 60%. Um, but when we look at the cytotoxicity using um, an LDH release um, cytotoxicity kit, you can see there's a much greater percentage of cytotoxicity uh, using the lipofection method compared to this chromatin-wrapped uh, antibody mediator they had. Um, so again, it's pretty much still basic research. They just wanted to look at, can they design a better vehicle that is still very specific in its targeting, 
um, but which um, isn't as toxic to the cells and is perhaps a more reliable construction method. So that's it for our case studies. Um, I want to take a couple minutes to talk about um, nanotemper and some of the collaborations we've done in some specific gene therapy methods. Um, and I wanted to quickly remind everybody of kind of what the considerations are when we talk about um, gene therapy methods, stringent topism, improved efficacy, and avoiding immune response. Um, so we've talked about all of these to some extent with our case studies. Um, but there's some other stuff that we've done that um, I think is really cool and helps show uh, how we have helped push the field of gene therapy forward. Um, so first, um, this is again monolith uh, measurements. We've talked about how MST works uh, with some of the case studies. And what you can see here is there's a distance affinity relationship for the multivalent interaction of influenza A virus and sialic acid. Um, and you can find that reference down here. Um, but um, what I want to point out is they have these sialic acid linker chains, um, and we looked at the affinity um, for the influenza versus the length of the chain. Um, so the distance between the virus and your uh, target of interest is actually a really important consideration when you're designing these vectors. Um, and what we found here, and you can kind of see, there's an increase and then a decrease as the linker chains are measured. And the optimal interaction is actually inter um, obtained with cell receptor space 50 angstroms apart. Um, so that's right here, it's NA52. Um, these would be really hard to do in, with some other methods. And while 50 angstroms has kind of been the accepted number. It's only just now that we can actually quantify that number instead of more qualitative methods looking at um, confocal measurements and such. Um, and um, yeah, so I think this is just a really interesting consideration when you're talking about using viruses as your delivery method for your genetic payload. Um, the other great thing about the monolith, since it works in solution, we were able to measure these um, whole cell interactions. So this specific inter um, interaction is platelet cells, and we looked at the anti-CD42 monoclonal antibody versus CD42 carrying platelets uh, versus the isotype control that doesn't bind. Um, and we didn't have to lyse the cells. It was just a plasma prep. Um, this was done in collaboration, and um, I think it's a really cool application of um, where the field is going and the sort of important considerations we need to think about moving forward. So we've already talked about targeting to specific um, receptor types, but the receptors are buried in the cell membrane, and there's a whole environment around them. So how is that going to be affected? And I think that's kind of the next step in reliable and safe genetic delivery is um, optimizing the targets, not just for our targets of interest, but also considering what else is around them or nearby. Um, we have another instrument called the Prometheus. Um, we call it a nano DSF instrument, so differential scanning fluorimetry. Um, very briefly, it uses a uh, chemical or temperature denaturation gradient, um, and it applies that denaturation to your protein samples, and it uses only the intrinsic fluorescence of your protein in order to measure the unfolding of protein in response to these gradients. Um, and that can be helpful not only for understanding the stability of your protein, um, thermal melting temperatures are often used as a parameter for protein stability, but also as creating sort of a thumbprint what does your protein look like when um, you're trying to compare either different batches or similar preps against each other? And that can be really helpful for gene therapy when we think about AAV serotyping. So if we build different types of um, AAV vectors for carrying our genetic information, we might find that some are more optimal than others, especially depending on what the delivery method is. Um, and so being able to quantify the stability and then also kind of qualify the profile of these um, AAVs can be really helpful for manufacture and scale up. Um, and finally, um, also using the Prometheus, um, since we're looking at the intrinsic fluorescence of our proteins of interest, 
We can follow an AAV's DNA loading because as the DNA is loaded into the AAV, its overall fluorescence gets quenched. And so we can actually use this to quantify how much DNA has been loaded into our AAV sample of interest. Um, and so um, the overall fluorescence is affected and therefore we can quantify it. Um, so those are just a few examples. Um, there's really so many areas of gene therapy that touch on biophysics and having uh, sort of a basic research approach to how to optimize these vectors, how to optimize their targeting, how to optimize their loading and creation. So um, I'm really excited to work for a company that's helping uh, push this field forward. And I think there's a lot of cool stuff out there um, waiting to be done to help continue pushing the field forward. Um, so just to summarize everything we've talked here today, um, we're uh, talking about improving established methods. So that's where most of our case studies came from. Um, we want to improve the selectivity of CAR T cells for expansion. So only expanding the population that has received our antigen receptor. We talked about improved targeting of CAR T treatment. So optimizing our chimeric antigen receptor for better longevity in the system and better targeting of um, the cancer cells. Um, we've talked about having better understanding of how genes are packaged, especially via pegylation methods. Um, so again, pegylation has long been a valuable tool in medicine delivery, but how do we really get it targeted correctly and how do we release the genetic payload? Um, and that peg enhancer um, treatment is a pretty cool approach to that. And then finally, we talked briefly on developing novel methods for gene delivery. And I think that will end up being a very important consideration when we talk about reliable scale up in manufacturing. Um, so continuing to think about looking forward, safety, efficiency, and expansion are all key takeaways. Um, avoiding toxicity and off-targets effects that have just always been the crux of gene therapy and will uh, continue to be so as we think about treating patients. Um, and additionally, there's a consideration of what gene therapy can really be used to treat. Um, as the field evolves, we can look for novel ways to use it as treatments. So not just for monogenic disorders, uh, as it was sort of initially conceived, but also thinking about these CAR T treatments and other similar treatments. How can we use it to treat much more complex diseases such as cancer? And so that is everything I have for right now. Um, I am going to leave us on this slide. Um, this is my little bibliography for the work I've done here. So if you are interested in reading any of the papers that I covered, um, I think that they're all really interesting and I learned a lot from reading all of them. There's some great research in there, um, especially with the CAR-T treatment. I didn't get too into the mouse or human studies, so there's a lot more information in there. Um, and additionally, I have some good background reading if you are just kind of interested in uh, knowing where the field came from and how the field has evolved. Um, so thank you. And I am going to try to look at the screen now. <laughs> okay. All right. Questions, comments? Um, oh, questions. All right. Um, thank you guys. All right. Um, how do you visualize the use of metallics such as gold or bimetallic gold, silver, QD stabilized by peg triggers, help internalization and mechanistic detection tools for oligo delivery? Okay. That is a good question. Um, I do not know as much about the sort of quantum dots and the delivery methods that use like metal particles and metal nanoparticles. Um, from my reading and from what I've done, I think broadly these ideas can apply to them. Um, I don't really have any specific information for you, unfortunately. Um, but I think like quantum dots delivery has also evolved and we didn't really even talk about that at all. Um, and uh, I'm not sure how it applies to nucleic acids specifically, um, but I really think investigating any route of uh, additional delivery is really helpful uh, when we think about these gene therapy delivery methods. Um, 
how does MST work and why might it use why might it be used versus other interaction slash affinity platforms? Okay, um, great question. I am going to share another slide with you. Um, so I talked a little bit um, about broadly how MST works. Um, here we have an example of a fluorescently labeled molecule. Um, and um, back here. okay, laser point. Uh, fluorescently labeled molecule, this is the fluorophore. And this is the molecule in its bound state, and this is it in its unbound state. Um, these molecules, as they are, we prepare them so that the amount of fluorescent target is the same in um, 16 different capillaries. And then the amount of ligand is titrated down in those capillaries. Um, so in each capillary, we have this mixture. They're moving uh, in solution and we activate a IR laser that triggers a response. Um, and so the degree that the fluorescence changes is going to be based on the environment of that fluorophore. So whether it's bound versus unbound is going to affect the degree to which that fluorophore gets quenched in response to the IR laser. The monolith is very sensitive, so this temperature change is only a couple degrees, but that difference in the bound versus the unbound state can be used to build those um, binding curves that we saw because we know how much ligand is in each um, capillary prep. Um, so once again, uh, any other questions? Uh, I think that's it for everybody. So um, I believe it is sign out time. This link is available as mentioned. Um, and yeah, we'll figure out um, about disseminating a PDF copy if you're interested. So cool. Thank you.